For the past 10 years, Karen Davis has worked as a photojournalist in Europe, Asia, and Africa. Oh, that's it, that's great. Her images of courage and compassion have graced the pages of publications all over the world. But there came a time when pictures weren't enough. She had to put the cameras down and get personally involved. This is the story of one woman's war. Karen Davis's busy career has taken her to the heart of some of the biggest news stories of our time. It's been a high-energy, globe-trotting lifestyle. For two years, she covered the rise of fundamentalism in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Her insider access led to an extraordinary portrait of Pakistan's President Musharraf. It made headlines all over the world. So when the biggest news story of all came along, she decided to cover it, but not as a photojournalist. 9-11 has been such a shock, and the war in Afghanistan, because I know that part of the world, I feel I've got to go back there. I've had a lot of editors ringing me up with assignments, but I've said no, because I've made a decision to go back as an aid worker, because I just want to do something to help. Forty days after 9-11, Karen is leaving for six weeks in northern Afghanistan. She's working for Concern Worldwide, a Dublin-based aid agency funded out of Europe and the U.S. Hi, Mum, it's me. I'm in a cab on my way to Heathrow. I'm on my way, yeah. I've got all my jabs, Mum, yeah. <laughs> and, I have, and I've got a lot of thermal underwear and packets of soup. <laughs> I'll keep my head down, yeah. <laughs> All right. All right, Mum. All right, bye. Bye, bye. First stop in Berlin is the Tajik Embassy to get a visa. Result on visa. Then it's back to the airport for a flight to Munich. I'm overnighting here before trying for Taji Care's once a week flight to Dushanbe. Well, the good news is I've got a ticket on the flight. It's full of journalists carrying the most unbelievable stuff into Afghanistan. I can't wait to get there now. Dushan Bay is the capital of Tajikistan, once a part of the Soviet Union, now an independent state. But Karen has no time for sightseeing. She's immediately put in charge of a concerned convoy. It's full of blankets and other supplies, and it's heading for Afghanistan. So this is Dushan Bay, and Tajikistan's here, Afghanistan's down here. We're on this road from Dushanbe, heading to the river border crossing point about here. Concern are in Nawabad camp. This area is called Dashti Kala. Um, the Taliban are over here on this side, Northern Alliance up here, and the front line runs along the Kochka River. Running a little bit late, one of the land cruisers had a puncture, over. We probably will not make it to the border until 6 or 7 o'clock, over. OK, that's a good copy. I'll let you know that, over. Because of the delay, the convoy must travel by night through a remote and dangerous part of the world. Uh, I've got to spend the night at a Tajikistan truck stop. Um, basically stuck at the border. All of the, the uh, drivers, the truckers, are getting pissed up on vodka. It's not great. 
not a great spot to be uh, stuck in. Next morning, the borders open, and Karen can start the last leg of her journey over the Amu Darya River and into Afghanistan. It's been a hell of a job to get this lot um, into Afghanistan. And it's only the first step of the way for the aid. I mean, it's got to get to the people, the beneficiaries, yeah. But anyway, first, uh, first hurdle over. I'm feeling really choked. She may be feeling good now, but Karen is headed for a desolate and war-ravaged area. Nawabad camp is home to over 5,000 people, many of whom have fled from villages overrun by the Taliban. Every family seems to have a story of Taliban brutality. They killed 20 people in our village. I just want my country to be free. I pray for God to remove the Taliban. They beat us and wanted our sons to join them. They killed my husband, but I escaped secretly with my son. I left everything behind. I have only the clothes I am wearing. An abandoned Soviet tank is used as a communal kitchen. But after more than three years of drought, food is scarce here. People are hungry, and with winter coming, they're desperate for shelter. And there's a war on. The front lines are just seven miles away. Karen arrives in Nawabad to find an uneasy stalemate. But it won't last. U.S. warplanes have already started bombing Taliban positions in other parts of the country. Concerns now about office is based in a walled compound next to the camp. After my sleepless night on the border, it's good to be here. The compound will be home for the next six weeks. It may not look like much, but it's quite luxurious for this part of the world. The question is how much we should trust, how much we can rely on. Phil Miller is in charge of Concerns Now About Operation. After months of waiting, he's just received a consignment of 500 tents for the camp. My first job is to help out with checking the tent distribution lists. The camp has been surveyed, and 500 of the most vulnerable families have been given a registration card. When they show the card tomorrow, they'll receive a tent. Compiling the lists is painstaking work. Each and I'm struck by three. Philip's patience and his good relationship with the staff. In any job you need to be patient. You can't always assume that you're right and the other person's wrong. And I find the people here fairly patient most times as well, polite, respectful. So I guess it's part of reciprocating. Next morning the distribution can begin. After nearly a year and a half of living in the open, some of the neediest families of Nawabad will receive a tent. The registration cards must be matched against the recipient's names. People are desperate, and the tents are valuable. Um, unfortunately, there seems to be a bit of skullduggery and fraud going on, and there's an, a list of missing cards. Uh, they're questionable. We don't quite know where they've gone. So it's my job to be the enforcer. It's a big step forward. Some 500 families now have tents, but thousands of others still have virtually nothing. 
Next morning, there's a crowd of men outside the compound. There's a strange tension in the air. This could be a problem. They're demanding to speak to Philip. There's lots of people here, Cosy. Yeah. And they have something to say. People are happy. They're here to thank you. We're really pleased you're here. We're really thankful to concern. It's possible. If you weren't here, we could have died. If you hadn't distributed tents this winter, we could have died. Come here. I've got tears in my eyes. I mean, that, that was just extraordinary. It was. How do you feel? A bit emotional, actually. Yeah, that's the first time that's ever happened. I mean, it's nice to see happy people, but one or two, but to see a whole lot of happy people all coming to say thank you, that's... Um, <laughs> I'm getting used to life in the compound. There are about 15 of us here, and I'm the only woman. Um, is that six, is that nine or zero? We have all the modern conveniences. Well, most of them anyway. It's just a move. The trick to this loo is to hold your breath, and you've got to hold it about 30 feet from the front door, and then you hold it for 30 feet as you leave. It stinks. The American bombardment of the Taliban positions close to Nawabad has begun in earnest. Ooh, that was close. <laughs> I do jump when the big guns go off. And what's fascinating is that the Afghans don't twitch, they don't move. To them, I guess it's like a car alarm going off. Nothing. But I do, I kind of jump in my seat. <laughs> they laugh at me, they do, they laugh. They think I'm a right sissy. Phil Miller has had to leave for another concerned project. But a visitor has arrived at the compound. Oh no, it'd be great to see you. Um, also to let you know, we've got a guest uh, staying with, with us at uh, the moment. It's Lynn from Physicians for Human Rights, who met you in Islamabad, over. Okay, she's here. She says hi. Um, she's actually basing herself here and uh, doing some surveying and research in the IDP camps. Over. Dr. Lynn Amowitz is a physician from Boston. She's left her young family back in the States to work here for six weeks. Is that? Zoe? I have a nine-month-old daughter who is at home uh, with her five-year-old brother. My husband is taking care of both of them. To see so many needy children, it's very hard. I mean, I, there are many times when I start crying just for my own personal issues about missing my children and seeing these kids that are so needy. Lynn is working for a human rights organization. She's in Nawabad to meet Afghan women and record their testimony. This woman has come from a Taliban occupied village. I want to talk to her. Migni Hal is 35 years old. The Taliban killed her husband a week ago. How did they kill him? Sir, I'm Christian. The Taliban wanted my husband to work for them, fetching water and collecting rubbish. He said, I don't want to do that. I don't want to work for you. He tried to escape, and they shot him. Did she see him killed? Yes, they brought his body in the afternoon. They said, OK, take the body. They wanted my son, too, and they beat me. I said no and took him away. I even dug a hole in the ground to hide him in. After one night, we escaped. Migni has lost nearly everything to the war. As a widow, she's particularly vulnerable, and she needs help fast. The 
There are horror stories all over camp. It's not easy. Sometimes I'd rather be taking pictures. Abdul Haq is a father of eight. Um, how long has he been in the camp? Uh, 18 months. 18 months. It turns out that Abdul Haq and his family fled their village when the Taliban took over and killed 20 of their neighbors. The reality of the situation here is beginning to tell on Karen. And it's not just the horrors of war. Sometimes sleep doesn't come easily. I'm absolutely tonight sick and tired of Afghanistan. I've had enough. I've had enough. I can't bear it. I want to go home. I don't care at the moment. I just want to jump on the pontoon, get to the Tajikistan, get to a hotel room and have a bath. That's all I want to do tonight. I've had enough. Karen has been looking forward to the arrival of Brian Stockwell, concerns logistician. He's just come in from Tajikistan. Brian's been an aid worker for 30 years. His job here is to get supplies into Nawabad and make arrangements for their distribution. OK, well, I mean, straight off, you would have the blankets and whatever further up here. Uh -huh. The people would move up, yeah. collect their blankets, move up a little bit Brian's more. idea is to distribute the blankets that came in with my convoy out in the open, in the camp itself. But there's a local problem that he doesn't know about. This is a lawless area, and to do it outside could result in a riot. Brian's full of ideas, but I can tell that the Afghan staff aren't quite sure what to make of him. Instead of saying, we cannot do this, we cannot do that, we have to start thinking, it is a new age. We have to start thinking, yes, we can do this, we can do that, together. One thing's for sure, he's not short of enthusiasm. We know this community. We know that we can do things. Meanwhile, Karen has arranged for Migni the widow to come to the concerned compound. There's one last tent left over, and Karen has promised it to her. Should we write down her name? With a fingerprint signature, Migni has a new home. Brian has warned me against getting personally involved, but in Migni's case, I have. On a more selfish level, you, you feel a little bit more personal satisfaction because you react with an individual rather than just a name on a huge long list. This really puts things into perspective. So much for my whinging about wanting a bath. <laughs> another day, another staff meeting. Brian's now realized that when he arrived full of enthusiasm, he'd misjudged the local situation. Now, yesterday was my first day in Dashtikwala. Now, I have to uh, say I am sorry for jumping in very quickly yesterday, full of ideas, well, without really understanding the local political kind of problem. So I'm sorry for all the trouble I caused you. Yeah. It's it amazing is, to it see this. To me. Brian's apology has disarmed the Afghan staff, and they're now completely on his side. Because I just wanted to distribute quickly, yeah. but it was a mistake. Every day, the aid workers are hoping for a big convoy of wheat flour. But for the moment, Brian can only gaze across the Amodaria to Tajikistan. The aid supplies are there, but all sorts of delays are holding them up. Today, there was no crossing because of some Afghan-Soviet problem. Yesterday, the weather prevented anything coming across. The day, day before was Sunday, they weren't working. Saturday, there was a lot of military ordnance coming across. And uh, all last week, there was just, uh, just total confusion. With no food coming in, people are getting anxious. When I left the compound this morning, two women approached me and they said, we haven't eaten for days, we're hungry, give us some food. And 
all I could say is, can I visit you in your, your tent? Very soon we will be giving some food. And they said, listen, you know, you're not listening to me. I'm hungry, I need food. There was nothing I could give them. Despite the war and all its difficulties, life goes on. Tonight, there's a wedding, and Brian is the guest of honor. After a frustrating few days, he's more than happy to let his hair down. It's uh, 20 past 6 in the morning and uh, I woke up and everything was very quiet in the house and I had a premonition that something was happening. And I come out here and I uh, see that they're offloading the trucks. The long-awaited supplies are finally beginning to arrive. After weeks of uncertainty, concerns now about operation is in business. <laughs> A massive distribution of aid is now possible. Later that evening, some news is coming in from Queens, New York. A big airplane has been Everyone immediately suspects a terrorist attack. Perfect timing for the Taliban, if it was a plane crossing into New York City. Lynn is worried about her family back home. Hello? Odetta, it's Lynn. Is Steve there? Hi. I, I need to speak to Steve. Is he there? Yeah, he's right here. Let me talk to okay, him. Okay, just a second. Good morning, afternoon, evening for you. Hey, what happened? We heard something on the radio and it's not clear because it was in Dari. What's going on? About 10 miles out from JFK, it crashed into, into Queens. Into Queens? Into Queens, yes. What's the word? Is it terrorist or not terrorist? That is not clear at this time. Um, but all of the airports in New York are shut down. Oh, God. So I'm sure all the flights are diverting to every other place. You know, again. What the hell is so, going on in this world? I mean, God, if it's another terrorist attack, I mean, what more? I'm almost safer here than I am at yeah, home. No, it's, it's bizarre, isn't it, to be, to be that close to a front line and be safer here than in New York City or in America. It's really a very odd... The news is that the Queen's crash was not caused by terrorists and something else. After weeks of bombardment, the Taliban are finally on the run. News of the Taliban's flight has had a dramatic effect. After months of exile in their own country, the people are leaving the camp to return to their villages. the widow has already packed up her tent. Can you tell her that I'm very happy for her, that she's going home? Oh, it's great. great. I'm sorry oh, too. I'm also happy yeah. about to be with my I know, am I squashing your hand? <laughs> <laughs> Many of the camp's residents are heading home across the nearby Kalkja River. But for the aid workers, this exodus throws up a whole new set of problems. Supplies have finally arrived, but the people are leaving. Should concerned staff follow the Afghans to their villages? Going back to these villages, uh, we run a risk, a big risk of mines. That's a, that's a main consideration now in the whole program. They're all over the place. It's a big safety factor, a big issue now. 
but Concern's operation must follow the people. Over the next few days, hundreds of tons of wheat flour, blankets, and other supplies will be trucked to the villages beyond the Kaukcha River. Karen will go with them. Abdul Haq and his family are happy to be leaving Nawabad, but they face a day-long trek back to their village. Karen has said all her goodbyes, except for one. Well, anyway, I've got things to do. So look, have a lovely time. Brian is staying in Nawabad to keep the aid flowing in. The Kauchka River was the approximate front line. It was a natural boundary against the Taliban. We're going to cross about here. Abdul Haq is heading to this place, Ruzbachar, his home village. And we're heading to Zad Kamar. By evening, Abdul Haq has reached his home in Rus Pacha. <laughs> Just three miles away, Karen has arrived at the village of Zard Kamar. Her immediate job is to scout some of the villages and to assess their general condition. So this was B-52 bomb? B-52 bomb? They're heading for Chechka, a village held by the Taliban for more than 14 months. After the hustle and bustle of Nawabad, Chechka comes as a shock. I don't know what she's saying, but this time I don't need a translator to understand. All I can do is to reassure her that we'll come back to help. It's really grim. Really grim. God, I didn't realize that it was quite this bad for some reason. I don't know what I was expecting, but not quite this. <laughs> this is a um, B-52 bomb crater that was uh, dropped a couple of weeks ago, maybe 10 days, two weeks ago. Um, we could hear the bombing from, and feel the bombing. It used to shake the earth from Dashti Kala, which is about seven miles from here. And I'm happy to say that nature's taken over and it's now a watering hole for the animals. Back in Zard Kamar, the aid workers are busy. There are landmines in some parts of the village, and before the distribution, signs are put up to warn people. This one appears to be disarmed. With the big distribution happening soon, the neediest families must be given registration cards. Abdul Haq is one of the recipients. Our problem is that we don't have enough food to eat. That's our problem. We've come home and there's no work. We have nothing. If they could give me one, I'd like a bicycle. Over the next few days, our preparations continue. It's an elaborate process but one that will ultimately ensure a fair and dignified distribution. 
At last, the weeks of uncertainty and hard work are about to pay off. It's distribution time. We've got about 200 people outside the gate and today they're going to get a bag of wheat flour, 50 kilograms of wheat flour. They can make bread from that. Two blankets and a kitchen set, which is uh, pots, pans, buckets, knives and forks. And I've got to say that I'm really excited and I'm feeling really happy today. It's taken quite a lot to get here, to get to this point, and this is what I came to Afghanistan for. It's a good feeling today. It's a good feeling for Abdul Haq, too. A 50-kilo bag of flour should feed his family for a month. He can hardly believe the kitchen set. In the meantime, his son will have to wait for that bicycle. This is Karen's last day in Afghanistan. By the end of this week, we should have distributed to 1,000 families, which is approximately 6,000, 6,500 people, which is great, really good. I must say, I can't wait to go, though. <laughs> I'm looking forward to going home and seeing my family now. Well, here I am back in London, but I keep thinking about my time in Afghanistan. It was an amazing experience, an extraordinary time. Working as a photographer, I had always maybe hoped to strike a chord with a photograph, maybe to raise some awareness about an issue. But working as an aid worker, the problems and solutions were very much there to be dealt with in a practical way, which was incredibly satisfying. I'll never forget Afghanistan and the Afghan people.